questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It is live. I just come from the Bible study uh, onto another set here in Spain. And I uh, just want to welcome you to the Q&A show to uh, Revelation TV's uh, program, which allows you, the viewer, to take part in, as indeed with most of our life programs. We want you to be able to have your say. Some of you certainly do have your say, and uh, some of it's encouraging, some of it's not so encouraging, but nevertheless, um, we're here. We do it because we motivated, I would say, when you read the scriptures, you want people to share what's coming in the good sense, because there is days coming, and we're, I believe we're already in that period, where we're facing incredible challenges, uh, both the personal level, corporate level, uh, in all aspects of our life. Uh, there's, uh, I don't think there's ever been a time in human history that we've been quite so challenged, and the world itself is breaking up into different uh, fragmentations of, of ethnic groups of people. I feel very sad when I see what happened again today in Aleppo. Uh, just, uh, it's almost a city that's destroyed beyond uh, recognition. Great historic sites, but more important, the, the loss of human life and the hope for the future where many thousands of, even hundreds of thousands of people have had to flee uh, to, for safety. And there is a day coming when none of this uh, will happen again. But we're in the middle of it, and somehow together we've got to get through it. And I want to be one of those that are here to encourage you. You know, all the more so as you see the door or the day drawing close to the return of Jesus Christ, all the more so we should be encouraging one another. And I would ask you, when you write your emails and your texts, to think and ponder on that, because it's so easy to use this tongue, which is like an udder of a ship, that can say or make great moves and boasts and often very discouraging to actually say something quite the opposite and build the church of Jesus Christ up, not tear it down. Some of you, God bless you and may he have extra grace for you. Others, the love of Christ is in you and thank God for your lives. You're humble people, uh, you're sheep-like and that doesn't mean to say that you're stupid and far, far the opposite. I think it takes a strong person to be meek uh, and to allow others to abuse you and say nasty things about you. So I'm trying to get there. Uh, but at the moment, um, I'm a long way off. But God's grace is sufficient for us, uh, or so it should be. But the church of Jesus Christ is something that is not really uh, followed by the many. You know, it's Jesus said that the road leading off into destruction is broad and spacious, and many, the majority, are going down that way. So it's the few who find the pathway to life, eternal life. So tonight, you know, it just might be an opportunity for you to put a question uh, to Philip Bell, who's one of the uh, representatives in the UK for I Creation Ministries International. Philip, welcome to the program. Very good to be with you, Howard. Thank you. Uh, challenging days, would you agree? Uh, absolutely, yes. I don't think the challenges get any less uh, for, particularly for Christians who are seeking to be faithful and to be relevant. Mm. It's an interesting day in which we live as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, 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 and yourself, just give us a little bit of, again, of your background for those who uh, have, have just switched into Revelation TV recently and not familiar with what you do, Philip. And uh, also, it's helpful to know what's on your heart and what motivates you to do what you do when you've explained it to the viewers. Yes, well, um, the organization that I'm working with, Creation Ministries International, um, it's an international ministry, as it, as it suggests, and it's a ministry, as the name says. So we are unashamedly not just about talking about creation, but also dealing with the questions that people have, uh, both in the church and, and out in broader society. And we seek to be very relevant. We spend a lot of time speaking in churches, uh, from time to time in educational establishments, even up to university level when we're invited. Um, we, we sometimes put on conferences, as actually we've been doing in the last few months. But all of what we do is to get people thinking about life's biggest questions. Um, that is to say, where do we actually come from, ultimately? Uh, why are we actually here? Seems a silly question, perhaps, to some people, but I think most people 
ask these questions one or many, many times in their lives. And, and if these things uh, are on people's minds, often the question also comes up, uh, what happens after this life? And so in the organizations, uh, Creation Ministries International, my colleagues and I, and it's the same around the world where we're based, uh, seek to engage people on these things. And one of the things, of course, which is very much at the fore in our day is uh, the challenge of science. Now, I'm, I'm actually someone with a science background, as many of my colleagues are. We're not anti-science, far, far from it. But we want to do justice to the facts of science on which all thinking people agree. But as Christian people, we also want to do justice to what the Bible has to say. And we believe that uh, true science is absolutely in agreement with what the Bible says. We think the Bible is not a scientific textbook, but it gives us the big picture uh, to understand the world and everything in it and our place in it and also, of course, our relationship to God. But we believe that science wonderfully supports that. And indeed, many of the things which have been discussed in even just the last few weeks in the media, in the scientific press, uh, wonderfully confirm what we see the Bible to say about the uniqueness of man, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah, in fact, uh, might be good, I'll just walk, give my guys in the control and heads up, but we uh, talked about the new plankton uh, species, which they thought was only just uh, in their about 30,000. They found one and a half million uh, vari variants on, on this uh, plankton life at the bottom of the oceans. I don't know whether you saw that in the news recently. I think uh, it was I a ship that. that's been out there for two and a half years uh, with scientists on board. And they were absolutely amazed uh, at the role, uh, the important role that they play, of course, and the, and the, the, the vast am amount of species, uh, variety of that species of plankton, mm. which obviously is beneficial to mankind's existence. Uh, without them, we would uh, have the air that we breathe, the oxygen. That's right. Well, I mean, a whole... Uh the whole uh, biosphere, as it's sometimes called, uh, the ecosystems of the world, very much um, uh, at the heart of those are the, are the uh, small marine algae which are in the oceans and the biomass, or the, if you like, the total mass uh, of organisms which use photosynthesis to make their own food, like miniature plants, if you like, in the oceans, far exceeds uh, that of all the rainforests in the world. And uh, so it's an extremely important part of life. And, and just how diverse all those marine uh, floating uh, small single-celled algae and other uh, similar organisms are is mind-blowing and uh, quite fascinating and staggering to the scientists. In fact, we know far less about our oceans as biologists in the world today that in the world we know far less about our oceans than we do about the surface of Mars, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. There's still much to be discovered, I'm sure. Now, just for the viewers' sake, so they could start, uh, let's... Uh, well, before we uh, go further with that, I have got this small clip, a uh, short clip, that uh, talks about the plankton and the importance of it. It's got great uh, pictures as well. We just uh, excuse us, you won't be able to see this, but you'll be able to hear it. Let's have a look at this. We were interested in these planktonic organisms because they're sort of the life support system of the planet, so we really need to know more about what they do to sort of support the planet uh, in a general condition. They're the base of the food chain, so everything, the bigger organisms will eat the plankton. So if there's no plankton, there's no fish, basically, in the oceans. They also, through photosynthesis, generate oxygen. In fact, they generate the oxygen in every second breath that we breathe. So incredibly important on a planetary scale. And they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere take it into the interior of the ocean where it can be stored for for thousands and millions of years so they're an essential buffer against climate change due to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere the the, the real uh, goal of the expedition is sort of to to see the status of planktonic ecosystems around the world and understand how sensitive they are to climate change so we can sort of get a feel for for how the oceans will look in a hundred years in 500 years time and so on. So the effects of humanity are, are really having quite a dramatic effect on these planktonic ecosystems, which is quite disturbing. Uh, so these effects are felt in terms of increased pollutants, uh, increased oxygen dead zones uh, around the planet, and increased levels of plastic, 
fragments of plastic which float in the oceans, uh, which affect the ecosystems and, uh, and poison uh, uh, the ecosystems in quite a dramatic, sad way. Out of the deep, these dazzling discoveries. You're looking at plankton, microscopic plants and animals that drift through our seas and oceans. They may be small, but they're vital. They produce the oxygen in every second breath that we breathe. Um, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They're at the base of the food chain, so if there's no plankton, there are no fish in the oceans. All kinds of things that we have to understand more about to understand how the ocean works. Well, this is the Tara, moored up now after a two-and-a-half-year voyage of discovery all over the world. The aim, in the words of the scientists on board, to take the pulse of the planet. What they found surprised them all. Scientists thought there were 30,000 different plankton species out there. In fact, there are a million and a half. We always thought that ocean biodiversity is a lot lower than, than di diversity on the land, but knowing now that there's something like one and a half million basically brings the biodiversity in the ocean up to a similar level to the biodiversity on land, in the forest and so on. The team collected tens of thousands of samples. They're still being analysed. Among the strangest, this, the siphonophore. Technically, it's a colony of plankton, but it can grow up to 40 metres long, and that makes it the world's longest creature. Perhaps, though, the real treasures here are the images collected by the ship's microscopic cameras. They reveal a whole new underwater world whose strange sea creatures, scientists say, can teach us much about life back on dry land. Uh, thank you for bearing with us there, Philip, because it, I think it was just important. It was something that caught my interest when this first came on the news last week, and I thought, yeah, this, this adds... Uh, a, a, a relevance to what we talk about when we're uh, trying to explain to people the interdependency of life and other forms of life had to come in, a, in an orderly fashion. It, they couldn't have evolved. It just wouldn't have been practical, would it? Uh, in a word, no. Um, I think the, the, the word which many scientists use when it comes to uh, relationships between different forms of life uh, is sometimes symbiosis. It just means living together for, for a mutual benefit, um, very different from a parasite which takes, t it's all uh, take, take, take. But when two creatures live together, for example, for benefit, we see a wonderful harmony and it does seem very much as if those creatures have been designed to have those kinds of relationships, and some of those are very intimate and very detailed. Um, but we're talking, um, well, that piece was talking about how the world, uh, the world systems of life, the phytoplankton, the plant plankton in the oceans, which, as, as was said, uh, using the sun's energy, they produce lots and lots of, of oxygen, which is vital uh, in our atmosphere, and also, of course, they absorb a lot of carbon dioxide, much more in fact than all of the, as I say, the rainforests do, uh, because 72% of our um, oceans are covered, uh, sorry, of our world is covered by ocean, therefore they make a huge impact on reducing the carbon dioxide. But I, th I think it's interesting that whilst I totally agree with you that um, this shows, I think you're saying it shows design, it yes. shows creative design and I completely agree. What I find interesting about the people that um, often are doing the research, and I commend them for their good scientific research, incidentally. Um, it's all excellent science. It's helping us find out more about the world. Uh, these surveys are fascinating. Um, I remember some uh, surveys of the ocean bottoms a few years ago were leading to the discovery of about 20 new species of creature per week on average. That wasn't merely single-celled creatures and colonies of uh, single-celled creatures. We're talking about all sorts of life, little marine worms and starfish and types of squid that have never been seen by science before. But what I found interesting was the word sad was used at one point um, by the person, one of the people in the piece, and, some, and, and there was a talk of worry and concern. And whilst Christians, I believe, should be at the forefront of efforts to learn more about our planet and certainly cons to conserve the world's resources, um, 
I think it's interesting that if you're not a uh, Christian, and certainly if you believe in evolution, that you would use the word sad or concern about the planet, because um, I'm not saying it's uh, the prerogative of religion, people of faith only, but if a person believes at one end of the spectrum there's no God, and this world simply evolved and it's made itself um, for no reason, for no cause, without a cause, and for no purpose ultimately, then it's intriguing that people will use words like sad and being worried and concerned about what humans are doing to the environment. Mm. And I suggest there's an inconsistency there. Let me go back to where I was about to ask you a question, really about the, the importance uh, of our origins or knowing about this uh, and why you and what motivates you uh, to actually give you, uh, your side of this and, that, and perhaps expound a bit more on that. I don't want to put words into your mouth to say what mm. you are. Well, I mean, as, uh, as a Christian um, who looks at the scriptures as absolutely uh, accurate and trustworthy, um, I don't say that pompously, but that is the standpoint of the people I work with in CMI and of uh, um, many, many people who's, who are interested in supporting the kind of work we do. I, I see Genesis, the first book of the Bible, as giving us more than just a nice story about our origins, where we came from. I believe it gives us the origin of the big picture events which happened in history, uh, where this universe came from. Um, of course, not a detailed astrophysics or cosmology uh, uh, account, but it gives us the big picture. It gives us an account of where this world came from and its purpose and uh, where animal life came from, plant life. And of course, most important of all, well, certainly from a Christian's perspective, where human beings came from. We may share a lot of our biology with animals uh, and particularly at the DNA level but we're certainly very different from animals in kind. And we, um, I would say, from my understanding of the Bible, are clearly the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the very reason that he uh, made this universe, to have a relationship with human beings. And as you look at the world around us, um, it's a fascinating world, and all people can agree on that. But as People who profess not to have any faith look at this world, and that includes many scientists, certainly not all, but many scientists today would profess to be unbelieving regarding uh, religion and faith um, and a creator. They have to look at this world uh, as if it's the, re the result of an accident, uh, of, of no plan or purpose, and therefore human beings have no real purpose in being here. And so our conviction as, as people within the Ministry of Creation Ministries International is to get people thinking long and hard about that and also to challenge Christians who may have uh, bought into the idea that God somehow used evolution, a view I once took myself, and to get people to think about does that matter? And I think it does for all, for all sorts of reasons. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting subject, but more than just an academically interesting subject, it's, it's something which connects to who we really are um, how we relate to one another, and ultimately our purpose in being on the earth. Mm. The, I was speaking to a gentleman today, a believer, a good man, and uh, a God man. Uh, he was saying that, you know, maybe we, with our message on the origins of life, using Genesis and uh, being quite literal about it, we could uh, stumble people who are trying to find God because it, our way, uh, I'm putting these into my own words now, um, is too simplistic or too way out for it to be accepted in a scientific world that we live in, where there is so much uh, so-called evidence that we uh, have, everything has happened over billions of years. And someone just switching on as they could right now to Revelation TV and hearing what you're saying and what we're discussing, that really the Bible is an accurate account of the origins of mankind. It just seems too far-fetched for some, mm. even as Christ mature Christians. What would you say about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I can identify with that because I remember uh, for a while thinking that myself. Um, I think it's always interesting to ask such a person, not in any defensive way, and this, may account, this, this would be a question I put to many of the viewers, uh, who may be in, uh, feeling the same way, is what 
it, just think of a piece of evidence that, and I mean a net piece of evidence, a fact of science, not not someone's theory, not not that someone believes this, but some actual evidence that says to you, I'm certain that this can have no other, no, other, no other explanation except that millions of years of time was involved. Because, of course, the big difference between um, what sometimes is termed a creationist view of the world and the standard view that you would learn, generally speaking, in schools and universities today and, and, and through the media is time. Uh, as one evolutionist put it some years ago, time is the hero of the plot. So given enough time, the impossible becomes almost certain, becomes probable. Um, and, and that, uh, many people, of course, will recognize that the evolution is highly, un highly unlikely. The, most lead the leading proponents of evolution admit that fully. Indeed, one of Ri Professor Richard Dawkins' books was famously titled by him himself, Climbing Mount Improbable. He, no one denies that evolution is highly improbable. But what people believe is that given time and with processes they, they would believe uh, they have worked out, that the impossible or the improbable becomes virtually certain. And that's where a lot of people today are in disagreement. Increasing numbers of people, including many scientists, they may still be the minority, but including many scientists, are in disagreement on the science. Even people who have no profession of any kind of faith uh, as I do. They, they have their scientific reasons, they would say, for not accepting millions of years of evolution. The scripture says uh, with man it may be impossible, but with God nothing's impossible. And given time, as you said, uh, you know, this is something that Jesus demonstrated, for me anyway, uh, in the miracles, uh, for example, yeah. turning the water yeah. into wine. He did it instantaneously, the, lazy, the raising of Lazarus, the, the healing of the blind man and the, uh, the lame and, and so on. They were instantaneous almost. Uh, so yeah. didn't uh, need time. Did God need billions of years to do the creation? <laughs> as is recorded in Genesis. Well, cl clearly, if, if we allow God to be defined as so, uh, a being who is all-powerful, who knows all things, who's outside time and space and matter and energy because he created those things, by definition, uh, a God such as that would be unlimited in his knowledge and his power and his, in his ability um, and uh, doesn't need time. In fact, um, he, let's turn it around for a moment for, for those viewers who may say, well, I think it's quite reasonable to say that the science, you look to the scientists to tell you how it's done and, and, and surely evolution over millions of years is, is, is the way to, the way that creation happened. But the Bible perhaps gives us some reasons why uh, we're here. So science tells you how, the Bible tells you why. It seems very uh, very nice sort of harmony for some people until they actually read the Bible and find that uh, the Bible tells you actually a great deal of information about uh, what God was doing and when he did it and doesn't actually give you any information in Genesis about why he did it. But, but to the point that you look at the data, you look at the evidence of science, you find that the scientific evidence simply conflicts with the evolutionary view. And time... In a sense, for, for many evolutionists, I don't want to be unkind, but becomes almost like a substitute for God. Because what people are reluctant to attribute to God, to say that God did these things, they say, well, let's, given time, as I say, the hero of the plot, anything can happen. And, and it may, maybe, maybe I can put it this way, and I have seen this before. Instead of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which we read in the Bible, were clearly there um, right at the start. God says, let us make man in his own image. There's, there's a, the, the, the Godhead there. Uh, we know from John chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 17, that um, Jesus is, is the word of God, and uh, by him all things were made, uh, everything, visible and invisible. Nothing was mm -hmm. made without him. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is the creator. But we also read of the spirit of God hovering on the surface of the waters, right at the very outset, right at the very beginning of the creative activity of God. So you've got the, the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, and God, the Holy Spirit, all involved in creating this amazing world. But 
uh, I have to say that in all my reading over uh, several decades now um, of, of the subject of evolution and alternative views of uh, origins that leave God out of the picture, it's a different sort of, some people would say, trinity. You've got Mother Earth, uh, there's no God, and you've got uh, Lady Luck, which is, you know, the lucky mutations that happen to the DNA of living organisms that change them gradually from one kind into another. And of course, Father Time. So you've got Mother Earth, Lady Luck, and Father Time, instead of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I do think that for some people, it, it is, uh, not all, but for some people, it's an alternative religion. religious philosophy. Yeah. Good. Uh, I mean, a good <laughs> definition there. Uh, what, what, this question here, it, it comes up time after time, but I'm saying it, oh, I'm going to ask the question because it's important to the person who sent it in. For those out there in television world, please be patient uh, when questions come up time after time because genuinely people want the answer and it might be the first time they've switched on. And the whole idea of Revelation TV is to reveal... Uh, to mankind information which hopefully uh, has come from the inspired word of God. Anyway, uh, was there death before Adam? Uh, animal, plants, etc. Uh, this is from Darren. That's an excellent question. Uh, the short answer is um, there was no death of human beings, certainly, um, and a majority of Christians will, will agree with that. Um, Certainly there are Christians who would argue, as I once did, that God used evolution. Some, but not all of them, would believe that human beings didn't die, um, as we think of human beings. That is to say, uh, God made Adam in his image, and uh, Adam was the first man, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And uh, Adam called his wife Eve, we see in, one, in Genesis 3 verse 20, because uh, she was a mother of all living. So quite clearly, the Bible is saying that all people on the world, in the world today uh, are, are coming from Adam and Eve as our ancestors. And that's an interesting subject in itself. But, uh, so I don't get off, uh, get off at tangents. What, what we see there is that uh, God has made human beings and he's made all animals and there is no death. In fact, animals only ate plants, which we read in the verses 29 and 30 of Genesis chapter 1. That was God's intention. Every kind of uh, animal that was, was creeping on the ground, the beasts of the field, in other words, the wild animals, the birds of the air, all the flying creatures, what we would call today reptiles, birds and mammals, certainly were not killing and eating each other for food. Uh, but the Bible gives an account of how this world that God called very good, the last verse of Genesis chapter 1, became spoiled, a world which he then cursed because of man's rebellion and the taking of the fruit from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil um, by Adam and Eve is the reason the Bible gives to why a world of perfection and beauty in every way, uh, in a world with, which, which was absent from death, became ruined. Now, going back to the question, what kind of death then was present before, the, before um, that ruination of the world? Mm -hmm. Certainly not of human beings or animals which the Bible describes as nefesh. It's a Hebrew word and it means um, animals which, if you like, have the breath of life in their nostrils. God mm -hmm. breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, we read in, in the book of Genesis chapter 2. And that, uh, that word nefesh is used to describe other kinds of creatures that we would call um, heart, the vertebrates, so animals which have blood thrown, flowing through their veins. In fact, Scripture records that the life of the flesh is it's in the blood. blood. So if you like, animals with blood flowing through their veins and which breathe, um, so reptiles, birds and mammals especially, uh, but others as well. Certainly, plants, plant cell death is not the same as animal death and, and therefore uh, and, and we know that because plants were given for food. So plants were, you know, if you like, in inverted commas, dying. Uh, but that's not biblical death. Death is defined in the Bible is, is as, uh, as I've mentioned, breathing uh, life with, with, with blood flowing through its veins. So the question then arises, were uh, plant cells 
dying. Well, they certainly they were being removed. They were dying biologically, but not biblically, if that makes sense. Yep. There, there was no issue for plant cells to be dying. Uh, there was no issue for us to have various types of bacteria, for example, living in our stomachs, like E. coli. Uh, there would have been nice ones, though. Um, not There wouldn't have been any pathogenic or disease-causing bacteria. All the bacteria and other microorganisms in the world prior to the fall, when it was originally perfect, would have all been harmoniously living uh, with other creatures, perhaps helping them um, as part of their gut flora, their, their, their microorganisms in the gut to help digestion of food, that kind of thing. So cells themselves could have been uh, being removed, um, and I could go on into detail, but I won't. Yeah. I, won't uh, I think yeah. that probably gives enough of an answer. That's good. I'd, I'd just like to one, uh, ask you one other little point connecting with that is, what do you think Adam uh, took or perceived when God said, in that day that you eat from that tree, you will surely die? If death uh, was not something he was really conscious of, he would be able to relate to that being a serious issue. Mm. Again, that's a question we get asked uh, fairly frequently, and it, it's a fair question. But when you step back and think of everything that uh, Adam and Eve knew, they were created fully formed. They were created, um, who knows how old they were, but uh, they were men, and uh, he was a man and she was a woman. Uh, they weren't children. They were created with language. They were created with capacity to think, to have what... Um, uh, a psychologist would call high cognitive abilities, and I'm sure they were extremely intelligent. They certainly weren't dumb brutes. Uh, they weren't Neanderthals, uh, uh, or the way that people describe Neanderthals. I think Neanderthals, by the way, were fully human, but that's another story. Uh, they were very, very intelligent, bright, capable uh, human beings who already had the ability to understand language, already had the ability to understand God's commands, already had the ability to relate to the world around them, because it was all God-given, everything that they were able to do was was um, uh, it was as if they were created as if they had a history, I suppose you could say. Um, although they were, well. of course, on at the end of the sixth day, they were just hours old. And when God said to them, um, very uh, straightforwardly, um, and you read this in Genesis two, um, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, certainly we read that He spoke this to Adam. If you eat of that fruit, Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We have to just acknowledge that God had given Adam a capacity to understand uh, something about death. Now, he didn't know death experientially. He didn't know what death would be like because he hadn't seen death. But nevertheless, he, had, he was created with an intellect to understand. And uh, in, in the same way that God understands what sin is, although God has never sinned, um, Adam and Eve could have understood that if they rebelled, there was something uh, very deeply wrong about that, going against God's command. If they sinned, um, there would be a consequence. So I don't think there's any logical problem with uh, understanding that uh, although they hadn't experienced death, they didn't know what sin, uh, they hadn't committed sin, they knew uh, and understood what okay. was being told them. Fair and they knew the gravity of, of disobeying that command. Very good. Very good answer. Um, Philip, do you believe in alien life and also do you believe God created them? Asks John. Um, the only kind of aliens I believe in are, are Christians. <laughs> uh, as scripture we live on another tells planet. us. Uh, in the old fashioned use of the word aliens, we, if, if you're not uh, in your own land, uh, to some extent you're an alien. And Christians are described as aliens and strangers, not, not of this world, because we've. we've, we've um, not, yes, not because scripture. anything good in ourselves, but because of what Christ has done for us in giving us the free gift of his salvation. If we, if we know the Lord, then we know that um, our citizenship is in heaven and uh, we're, in a sense, aliens in this world. Uh, and we're here to uh, carry out his purposes and, and do his will and show the love of God in, uh, in Christ to others. But I think the question is about, are there aliens, is there any life on other planets? Is there any other race of that's the um, if you like, sentient or intelligent beings, perhaps uh, um, as you see in some of the science fiction dramas and, doc and documentaries. Well, I think the short answer that a Christian has to give to that, and I don't want this, again, sound um, condescending, but if we really know what the Scripture is saying, we cannot acknowledge that God has created other life. And um, I take you to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens 
and the earth. He doesn't say he created the heavens and the solar system. He doesn't single out any galaxy out of the countless billions of galaxies. It doesn't, it doesn't mention the other stars in our solar system. It, it talks about the universe and it, and, it, and it talks about the earth. And uh, it's clear that the whole Bible is about the earth as God's center of activity. Can there be other alien life forms? Well, like just, just as a few um, biblical answers for anyone who's watching, um, I don't think it would make sense that our world was cursed by God because of the sin of Adam. And by the way, the, the Bible makes clear that the whole creation is cursed and it's groaning. We read that in Romans 8, 20, 21 and 22. It doesn't, doesn't make sense uh, to think of the universe groaning under a, under a curse because of some guy called Adam who sinned on planet Earth. And, you know, you've got Dr. Spock on planet Zog also suffering the effects of the curse, um, who's done nothing wrong. I mean, I don't want to sound facetious, but that doesn't make sense. If God was fair, would he then have to deal with the sins of other alien races? Would he need to send his son to atone for their sins? People have actually discussed these very things. Um, Professor Paul Davies, a, a um, physicist and um, an evolutionist, has talked about how absurd that would really be, and I think he's quite right. But mm. we know from Scripture, God, Jesus is the man, Christ Jesus. It makes it clear that he's in heaven now as, 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 um, as uh, the second Adam the last Adam, and uh, he's finished his work. He's not going to atone for other sins of other alien races. He performed one sacrifice for sins forever, it says in Hebrews, and he sat down showing that he's finished his work. And, to, and one other point is that, of course, the church, Howard, of course, we're the bride of Christ, aren't we? So Jesus is not going to be, if I say this reverently, a polygamist. He's not going to have other brides. Um, we wait for the marriage supper of the Lamb, that the church, the true church of God, will, will um, meet the Lord uh, as, uh, as the bride. And so I think biblically we can rule out uh, alien life in that sense. But the scientifically, the idea that aliens could have possibly visited our Earth is, is far beyond um, science fact, because the nearest star, um, Alpha Centauri, um, well, it's in the binary system with Proxima Centauri, is over four light years away. So traveling at the speed of light, which is impossible for a spaceship to do, it would take you four years to get there. At, at the speeds of maybe the Apollo uh, rocket that powered the moon missions in the 60s and early 70s, it would take you getting on for 900,000 years, nigh on a million years, to do a one-way trip. Uh, so unless we've got doctors, you know, we've got Captain Kirk and the... And the, uh, the crew of the Star Trek and the Enterprise traveling at warp speed, which is science fiction when I last checked, uh, there is no possibility that um, there can have been people uh, or, or human, alien life forms visiting us across from other, other planets in our galaxy, let alone outside our galaxy. I agree. I agree with you. That's too not much to, not to, to be settled science here. And if you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, with creation proving to be more obvious uh, and to the heart of the truth, would this be a perfect opportunity to get schools to teach creation and put pressure on the government to do so? Ask Kieron. Well, that's a very topical question, uh, because I think, Howard, last time I was on your program, we talked about, um, uh, one of the things we talked about was the increasing restrictions being brought in, um, certainly in the UK, as to what can be taught in schools. There's a lot of ambiguity. That people are not certain what the latest legislation means. Um, but there's a clause uh, from Michael Gove's legislation, the, the, the um, government minister for education, mm -hmm. which seems to some people to indicate uh, that, and, and, they, and they call it evidence-based views, quote unquote, should not be taught in schools, not merely just science lessons, but religious education, in fact, any type of uh, subject in, in a state-funded school. Now, it depends what we mean by evidence-based, and frankly, that is a question which people are considering today and, and, and unsure about. I, I know from talking to people who've been in touch with um, some of the leaders of uh, education in this country, themselves evolutionists, that they would say, this does not rule out people going into schools and teaching uh, creationism or intelligent design 
at least in religious education classes. Um, my understanding is that it's not illegal, but I think, as I said, there is ambiguity that we're, we're unsure. And um, uh, at the moment, if you're a faith school or a free school that receives uh, part government funding, then you cannot teach um, any kind of uh, intelligent design or even a sniff of it in, in any, anything to do with science. Um, and you can't, you're not, some people would interpret this legislation to mean that you can't offer, you, you could say, I believe this and that about creation, I believe what Genesis teaches, but the moment you might uh, bring some evidence to bear to, to say, look, what I believe connects with the real world, some, some people think that that's actually going beyond the pale. I, I think it smacks to most people of um, almost like Stalinist Russia, um, to say to people, look, you're entitled to believe what you want to believe, but keep it private. And the moment you dare to try and say what you believe and, and uh, suggest that you've got some evidence for it, you know, we'll censor you. Mm -hmm. Has it really come to that? So the short answer to the question then is, I would take an opportunity, every opportunity, and I'd say this unashamedly, to influence young minds to think and to make up their own mind, to give them all the evidence and let them make up their own minds. And I hope that every good teacher, true teacher, regardless of their point of view, would see that that is good education. Not telling people what they must think and forcing it down their throats, but giving them all the facts and letting them and helping them make up their own mind. Good. There's a gentleman here who'd like to make his own mind up. Alec uh, writes in, or he's headed the email, answer this and I might begin to pay more attention. Hello. Just thinking about things, it is said that within us there are traces of things like organs which have become redundant as we as humans begin, our beings continue to evolve. If that is the case, uh, can I raise with you the friction skin ridge system on the palms and fingers and soles of the feet which don't immediately offer a purpose for living today but might have done in times past? Uh, they, well, the, if, if, if the gentleman's talking about the uh, print, fingerprints that, of course, you would um, have taken for um, any kind of forensic test, they most certainly have a function. If, if you burn the, um, if you have burns on, on your hand, the palm of your hand, particularly on your fingertips, you would discover very quickly the function that uh, those prints serve. If you pick up, at, say, a glass of water without fingerprints because they've been scorched off, you find that this glass, you have to grip it much more tightly because the glass will slip through your fingers. They provide a tremendous uh, grip. And um, I think it's quite clear that fingerprints and, and, and the whole um, ridge system on the palm, palms of hands and also feet gives some purchase. And you find this incidentally uh, on, on other animals as well, uh, well, certainly the apes, gives you uh, a strong reason to see them as being used as grip. But he mentioned the other vestigial organs, uh, vestigial meaning left over from evolution, mm -hmm. um, redundant things, I think, was the word used. And yes, it used to be claimed that we had possibly up to 180 parts of the body, those tissues or organs or bits of bits and parts which didn't seem to have any function. Um, and, and people suggested, well, there you are. The, these, these were, these are parts of the baggage of our evolutionary ancestry from, from apes and back into the dim and distant past from other animals too. And these no longer serve a function. But as we've discovered more and more about biology and about human biology especially, we found functions for practically all those things. And I think it would be a brave person to say that um, the human body has lots of redundant, uh, useless leftovers from evolution. Take a few, just a few examples that uh, people can check out. The tonsils, and the uh, appendix. appendix, they're actually a very important part of your immune system for fighting infection. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can live without them, uh, but, but uh, they serve a function. The appendix serves its, most of its function, or a particular function, in the uh, neonatal stage of life, so that before the baby's born. It's much larger in proportion to the um, uh, size of the, the body. The same is true of the spleen. Um, than when the child is older. Um, and it contains gut-associated uh, lymphoid tissue, that is to say it produces cells which 
make antibodies. And it's important because it's at the, the, this is the appendix, it's at the junction of the small and the large intestine. And so it's, it's important for keeping uh, bacteria under control in that location of the gut. And then we could look at other structures such as the pituitary gland in, in the brain near what's called the hypothalamus. That was seen at one point, uh, they knew nothing about what it did and so they said it was, was pointless and left over, useless left over. But any student who's studied anything about what they call the endocrine system, the, which um, is to do with hormones, will know that the pituitary gland has a very important function for all sorts of hormones and, and keeping a balance and feedback system going with those. Uh, and we could go on, that, or the, the coccyx, the tail, so-called tailbone, human tailbone, is certainly not some leftover from when we allegedly had tails, but serves a vital function. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, it's got muscles and ligaments attached, which movements of which with the coccyx enable you to pass, um, you know, your your waste food uh, or your digested um, waste food, your feces, when you go to the toilet. And also when a woman is in childbirth, movements of that, uh, that coccyx, so-called tailbone, um, enlarge the birth canal, enab enabling the, the, the baby's head to be born. So you can live without some of these things, but um, you know it, they're not functionless by any means. Um, there's an email or text here. It's quite lengthy. So, Michael, it's a bit difficult for me to go through all that on a live show. Um, uh, sorry about that. I'll just leave that for the moment. Uh, Hiya. I thought plankton seriously helped oxygenated, oxygenate the water for the sea food chain, not the atmosphere. Also, what sort of effect could the likes of waste plastic, perhaps even other man-made toxins in oceans that is eaten by f sea life, that enters the food chains, that is not digested, then ends up on your plate? Could we have medical health issues in the future? So Charles from uh, Wallington here is asking a few questions. Mm. So the oxygenated water, was that just for uh, obviously the, the, the sea creatures? It, 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 it's in, it, it's um, some sign of a good scientific mind thinking that through. But basically, as oxygen is liberated by any plant life it underwater, um, it will actually, and it comes out, what happens is the oxygen to a plant is a waste product. And it will come out through uh, the, the, the leaves, um, or in the case of single-celled algae, microorganisms, it will diffuse out and into the oceans, and it will, a certain amount of gas can dissolve in a fluid, in, in water, but a lot of it will uh, escape into the atmosphere, the vast majority. And uh, there is no controversy about that. That is one of the ways that you, you oxygenate the atmosphere. Uh, so as animal life, both in the oceans and, and above ground, uh, and above the, the water level, as they breathe, and, uh, and other processes um, use oxygen as well. Anytime you, you of course, burn anything, you're, you're using oxygen. These all remove oxygen, and so the oceans do indeed serve a vital function in, in keeping the atmosphere oxygenated. And it's, it's good to have uh, plants, of course, in an office um, because they remove carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, which is a poisonous gas to us, and they, they, they kick out the oxygen which we breathe in. But um, yeah, it's interesting because carbon dioxide and oxygen will dissolve in water, but the warmer the oceans get, incidentally, the less gas they can hold. It's not, it's the exact opposite of what we know to be true. If you have a warm cup of tea, you'll dissolve your, your spoon of sugar, if you like sugar, more quickly um, than if it's a cold cup of tea. Um, but it's the opposite with gas. Maybe a bit counterintuitive that the, the warmer um, water is the less gas it will dissolve so actually um, and I'm going to open a honeypot here but the the more oceans warm up the more of the gas comes out and that includes carbon dioxide so that the oceans can hold less carbon dioxide they, there are less of a sink for carbon dioxide if the oceans warm up I know that wasn't really the question but it's you know, gas to know dissolved, that, yeah. but it comes out as oceans warm which is interesting and then the other issue is the pollutants and the plastics and so on. Well, the oceans are huge. Um, we, we don't really comprehend. I think it's very difficult to comprehend just how big they are. Someone put it like this, and, I, and I, you might want to check this out, but I think I've got this correct. Between here and the moon, if you erected a pipe 
supposing you could, um, say something in the order of 50 miles in diameter, mm -hmm. height from here to the moon. The moon's on average about a quarter of a million miles from our Earth. The ocean's waters are so they're so great in volume, they would stretch, they would fill that pipe all the way from here to the moon. Mm -hmm. Now that's yeah. a vast amount of water. And so the, not, the, the level of, uh, the level like of pollution. A, a pollution is not that great compared to, comparatively. Yeah, speaking. and I don't want people to think I'm saying it doesn't matter. Of course, we shouldn't um, just spoil yeah. the environment and, and, and pollute water. But um, taken as a whole, um, this is not highly significant. It's interesting when that uh, terrible earthquake happened off the coast of Japan a year or a couple of, what was it, a year and a half ago. Um, and caused that terrible tsunami wave, which, uh, as we know, devastated a lot of the coastal regions of that side of Japan. Um, it resulted in vast numbers of trees and, and debris ending up floating out to sea. And uh, I'm not sure if any of it's still there, but quite possibly it is. But for months afterwards, um, there was this kind of slick of debris, and there would have been all sorts of stuff there. But, but we, we live in a world which has coped with um, disasters in the past on, a, on an enormous scale. And I'm talking about in human history. Um, and it's amazing how the world deals, I say the world, the, the, the world's ecosystems deal with pollutants. Uh, even these terrible oil slicks that um, happen when you get um, huge disaster, you know, huge um, shipping disasters. Terrible though that is for marine life, it's often pleasantly surprised biologists and environmental biologists uh, how quickly the uh, environment recovers and how the, the, these things, you know, the waves break up the oil and that, that's far more devastating than bits of plastic. So yes, it's potentially, potentially the case there could be some health issues, but highly unlikely from ocean water, I would think. Plastics mm. that we make are still a tiny proportion of uh, uh, tiny in proportion to the volume of ocean water. OK, Philip, I've got a text here which says, any chance you could read some texts and emails up before the show finishes, says Luke. OK, um, let me read a few more, just some quick answers then. Love the way you're showing all the amazing world our Lord has made um, by his word. A few years ago, the Holy Spirit showed me what beauty there is in one blade of grass. I cannot put into words what I was shown. It was so deep. And I say this just... Um, because I believe the human eye cannot see all these things. Uh, the natural things in the world are things made uh, that God made are wonderful and perfect in every way. God bless you, says Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. June writes, I've been watching Chuck Misler. Part of his teaching was on Genesis 1. He said that in Hebrew, it's it possible to translate verse 2 in a way which allows for the gap theory. He said that something catastrophic might have happened, which he interpreted as judgment. Are you able to expand on the Hebrew text that he mentions, says June? Uh, well, I mean, I, I respect Chuck Missler certainly as a, as a fellow Christian with a lot of excellent things to say. I, I would disagree um, if that's what he believes uh, in regard to verse, verses 1 and 2. I think it's interesting that people start with, and this is generally the case, I don't know about um, this gentleman, but we start with this view that there's millions of years, and that's a problem. And the best way to do it is try to best way to deal with it is to try and find somewhere in the Bible to fit it. Mm -hmm. I did this myself, and so I know exactly um, the rationale or the reasoning behind that. But this is biblically unacceptable and scientifically um, useless because no scientist who who believes in uh, an old Earth, millions and millions of years of evolution is going to be satisfied if you turn around and say to them, uh, we think the millions of years can be shoved in b between two verses in Genesis, because they want Genesis, uh, they, they want uh, evolution to be a natural process. Um, moreover, the, the gap idea... Um, can you be quick, on, Philip? I want to get one more question in if I yeah, can okay. as well. I'll, I'll yeah. deal with it quickly. The gap idea relies on the absence of any information about um, something which is supposed to have happened. And, and that often includes a, a global flood in the days before verse 2. And yet we've got three or four whole chapters on the global flood, which the same people then have to deny. I cannot, could I possibly plug just one place where people can go, Howard? Yes, yep. Um, 
If you go to the, the website creation.com uh, and type in, in our search engine and any of the things we've been discussing today, but gap theory, uh, you'll get a really good answer. You've got lots to read on, on, on that particular question. Fantastic. We've got your information on the screen. Just hold that there, even though I will be talking over you. Keep your image there. I'm going to read you this question. Dear Howard, oh, it's not a question, it's a statement. Dear Howard, I'm afraid you've become totally obsessed evolution and geologies, uh, genealogies. Sorry. Was Paul wrong not to major on this, as you do, says Neil, <laughs> with a loving kiss next to it. Um, yeah, in fact, I had this discussion tonight with some of uh, my fellow workers and brothers in the Lord. Um, am, am I, I, I seem to have majored on this, I must admit, but is that what God, why God allowed me to have this station? One of these points. I, if, it, if it wasn't so, then I shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And it's time Could for I me to go. Howard? And I have been thinking seriously of going because I'm as much tired, I could do, get a life, you know what I mean? <laughs> Instead of doing this every night. Mm. Could I add something very, very briefly? Yep. Um, I applaud what you're doing because I, I consider that this subject is not the only subject, of course, that affects Christians and other people, but this subject, um, I believe, is, the one, is one key reason why many, many people think Christian faith is irrelevant. I know you believe the same. Yeah. And um, if we believe in a God and we believe in, a, in this world also having an, a, an enemy, the devil, the enemy of God, who seeks to keep people in the dark about the reality of God and his amazing love through Jesus Christ. And one of the ways he does that, I believe, is by telling people or convincing people um, that they're just evolved, there's, there's no need to, to take any account of God, then we need to be uh, coming up with good answers and reasons why it's important to believe what Scripture teaches. And therefore, we cannot ignore the things which are the biggest stumbling blocks in the 21st century uh, to people coming to faith. So I, I applaud what you do. Thank you. Uh, but it might be an end of an era. I don't know. But anyway, Philip Bell, uh, I want to thank you very much for, for being with us on Revelation TV. And to all of those of you out there, um, I will think very carefully about what I do in the near future because uh, maybe it is time to go. But thank you very much for being with us on Revelation TV and answers and questions. I should say questions and answers. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Philip.